Good day. And now let's join together to talk about basics of invasive ventilation, part one. This is a two-part series because there's a lot to talk about. But I'm so excited and I want to remind you about the importance of those four major issues in mechanical ventilation. Number one, is your patient appropriately oxygenated? You're going to evaluate that not just by the PaO2 and the saturation, by the PF or the oxygenation index, which will help us understand if the oxygen we gave down the ET tube actually reached the alveoli and transferred into the blood. And number two, by whether or not our patient is removing CO2 through his process of ventilation. Always remembering that CO2 is produced by cellular respiration, but lung regulation is through the ventilation, and that's what, how we remove CO2. And number three, are the lungs compliant? And you might recall, we look at lung compliance by the plateau pressure, which is the delivery of tidal volume into the lungs and then the closure of the exhalation valve. And number four, not that we're going to talk about it too much right now, but is your right heart overburdened? All these pieces of information are necessary at the bedside to drive together, to tie up in a package, to help us determine what the next steps are to helping our patient and managing ventilation strategies. So, who needs intubation? Well, many types of patients, of course, need intubation. Anybody who has severe respiratory acidosis or profound hypoxemia, who has significant difficulty in breathing that has a refractory respiratory rate despite our other strategies, anyone who stopped breathing with respiratory arrest, if there's a profound alteration in the hemodynamics, the blood pressure is low, the central venous pressure is high, there's an abnormal heart rate or an acute myocardial infarction. In any patient who cannot manage their secretions and who is not able to manage swallowing, so if they've had a stroke or a drug overdose or profound abnormal electrolytes which affect muscular function. Any individual who has profoundly copious, viscous, thick abnormal secretions, pneumonia, from drowning, from bronchitis, persons with very significant uh, recent facial injury or any uh, gastrointestinal injury and any type of surgery, and of course in patients who have a very large abdominal girth with diaphragmatic upthrust into the thoracic cage. Now this isn't a complete list, but the obvious list of patients that we consider who need intubation. So I love this quote from Andreas Vesalius from 1555. An opening must be attempted in the trunk of the trachea into which a tube or cane should be put. You will then blow into this so that the lung may rise again and the heart becomes strong. Now, despite the fact that initially we don't open up a trach unless absolutely necessary, we are placing a tube into the trachea that allows us to raise the chest and to support our patients in the movement of volume in and out of the lungs and the recruitment of the alveoli. So our objectives for mechanical ventilation are number one, to improve gas exchange, oxygen uptake into the blood, CO2 removal from the blood, to actually relieve respiratory distress, to decrease the work of breathing, to reduce the respiratory rate, or at the very least, support the respiratory rate when a patient is compensating for metabolic acidosis. Decrease the cost of breathing. That means reminding ourselves that when the diaphragm is contracting and we're using uh, accessory muscles, blood flow is directed to the diaphragm and the accessory muscles because that muscular activity requires so much oxygen. So we want to be able to reverse that muscle fatigue and reduce the amount of blood flow required to those muscle groups in order to provide the work of breathing. To alter the pressure volume relations. So what that actually means is we want to open your lung so that the pressure generated when we flow a volume into your lung, that pressure reduces. Because we've reversed atelectasis, we've opened the alveoli, we've increased your compliance, but we always want to do that without creating further injury. And we want to permit lung and airway healing. 
avoid any of the complications that actually occur when we intubate patients and put them on the ventilator, making sure that we're paying attention to the stress of reopening and collapsing, and making sure that we're not over distending your alveoli. So, we think about mechanical ventilation as applied in two ways. One of them is with negative pressure. Now, negative pressure is how we breathe. When the diaphragm contracts and pulls the floor of the thoracic cage down, the pressure inside the lung drops and that sucks our air in. So that's a negative pressure. And the only way that we actually generate negative pressure ventilation is, of course, with an iron lung. So remember that iron lung. That iron lung allows us to reproduce a negative pressure ventilation. Now, negative pressure ventilation applies negative pressure intermittently around the patient's body or chest wall, and that negative pressure actually causes the pressure drop in the thorax. Now, negative pressure breathing, uh, when applied with an iron lung, is something none of us are ever going to have the experience of, but it is a philosophy behind spontaneous intermittent ventilation because spontaneous ventilation is generated by diaphragmatic contraction, pulling the wall, the, the diaphragmatic separator, the bottom of the pleural cage down, and generating negative pressure in the chest. Now, we like that. We like it because it's applied to the transmural pressure of the heart, and it promotes better ventricular volume loading, because it, as well as introducing negative pressure in the uh, in the pleura and in the alveoli, it's also a negative pressure in the right ventricle particularly, which actually allows us to suck more volume into the right ventricle. That negative pressure creates that gradient inside between the lung, the mouth, and the atmosphere. And true negative pressure ventilation can only be applied by an iron lung. So most of us have never seen an iron lung, haven't worked with an iron lung, but if you're at Grady, you can go to the fifth floor and visit an iron lung that's in the hallway of the fifth floor. What most of us are used to talking about is positive pressure ventilation. Utilizing positive pressure to push air into the lung, reducing the requirement of diaphragmatic contraction or accessory muscle work, and overcoming that thoracic pressure and intraalveolar pressure by the positive pressure from the ventilator. So when we look at our machine, we talk about the machines that we use at our hospital. We think about the control paddle, which allows us to make all of our settings, monitor the pressures and the volumes, and set our alarms. We also have enclosed in that a humidifier that actually humidifies this very dry gas coming from the ventilator. The circuit from the ventilator to the endotracheal tube or the trach tube of the patient our gas, gas sources, which for us are usually in the wall, and our power sources, which for us are the red plugs, because we never want to lose power to our ventilator. If ventilation goes down, we always have our power plug into the red plug because that will allow for generator application of power. Now, if we take a look at the screen of the PB Puritan Bennett 840, we might be using a higher level than 960, but I'm going to talk about the 840 because that's the preponderance of ventilator that we use at Grady Hospital. So first and foremost, if you look up at the upper left of the first square to your left, you see that big S. That big S actually is applied when the patient is taking a spontaneous breath. You'll see a big A if the breath is spontaneous, but then assisted by the ventilator, that's a ventilator assist, or a big C when it's a complete ventilator breath. So we have three types of breath, total spontaneous, an assisted breath, meaning the patient made an effort, but the vent turned on, that's the big A, and a controlled breath, which means the ventilator is delivering the breath regardless of the patient effort. And we look at our measured outputs, and that would be the total respiratory rate, seen here as F total, which is frequency total. Exhale tidal volume, which is what we measure to see what you're able to ex exhale based on recoil of your alveoli and air movement out. And then 
frequency times exhale tidal volume. So you see frequency there. Next to that is your exhale tidal volume. It's 566 here. And then frequency times exhale tidal volume displayed as minute ventilation. In, in relationship to that and going across the top of the screen, what we see is this is a spontaneous breath with a peak airway pressure, meaning the, as the gas flows into the airway at the peak of inspiratory flow, how much pressure is measured, and that's 25. The mean pressure, which is 9.1, that's the average, of course, between inhalation and exhalation. The positive end expiratory pressure, which is 3.2. The relationship of inspiration to exhalation, that's the I to E, and here it's 1 to 1.5. Now, that doesn't mean it's 1 second to 1.5 second. It means it's 1 part of the cycle, and 1.5 of the cycle is an exhalation, frequency, exhale tidal volume, and minute ventilation. And we're able to look at our patient's history, we're able to look at the mechanics, and we can look at the waveforms, which are the dynamics of the relationship of gas flowing in and out to an endpoint, and that endpoint being either pressure or volume in basic ventilation. Next to that, and this will appear on the lower part of your console, you will see the settings. So here you're seeing that our patient is on bi-level. So bi-level means high pressure, high time, low pressure, low time, okay? Very complex and beyond what we're gonna talk about in this scenario. But it's a beautiful setting to tell us what our patient's frequency is, what their high pressure is, that's the high peep, and below that, the low peep, so 20 high, five low, the time for inspiration, which here is 2.45 of the cycle, two and a half really of the whole cycle time or the actual inspiratory time. And then looking at these other relationships, pressure support on a spontaneous breath, looking at the flow and the sensitivity and the delivery of the flow plus the oxygen concentration. So lots of things to look at in the settings which come below the mechanics and the history on your Puritan Bennett ventilator. What we're going to talk about though are the most basic ventilator settings. So number one, the mode of ventilation. Number two, what's targeted, either tidal volume or inspiratory pressure. So if you're targeting tidal volume, you're on a volume ventilation. If you're targeting inspiratory pressure, you're on pressure ventilation. Both of those depend on your flow. So flow, from my point of view, flow is one of the most important things that we talk about. Flow is how fast or slow you're delivering gas to the target. So if my volume target is 400 tidal volume, I'm gonna flow gas until I reach 400 mLs of tidal volume and then flow stops. If my target is pressure, if my pressure setting is 35, I'm gonna flow gas until I reach the target pressure of 35, and then I'm gonna stop. Respiratory rate or frequency, pretty straightforward. How many times are we breathing per minute? How many times have I set my ventilator to actually perform its mechanics? How many times are you breathing above that? So patient rate is different than ventilator rate. And then the percent of atmosphere, that's oxygen. Remember that atmospheric pressure here in Georgia is around 748. And so if I'm 100% of 748, I'm delivering 748 millimeters mercury partial pressure with every single breath. So percent FiO2 is percent of atmospheric pressure. Flow rate is the rate of speed that I'm delivering gas and positive end expiratory pressure is that flow of gas that maintains throughout all of exhalation to open and maintain the opening of your alveoli. Okay, so one of the first and most important things, again, in basic ventilation, this is a basic ventilatory class, whenever your breath is supported by the ventilator, the limit of support no matter what mode you're on, whether it's spontaneous, assist, or control, no matter what mode you're on, and for us it's primarily spontaneous or assist control, the limit of support is determined by your preset pressure or volume. 
So if I ask you what mode your patient is on, you either say spontaneous or assist control. And then when I ask what your target is, the target is either pressure or volume. If I'm on a volume target or volume limited, there's a preset tidal volume. I'm going to flow gas to that volume no matter how much pressure is generated. So normal generation of pressure with a normal tidal volume of breath, that peak pressure should be less than 40. If you have airway resistance or alveolar derecruitment, that pressure will be higher if I keep you on a preset tidal volume for a normal lung. So remember, we talked about these attributes before. Size 10 body in a size 10 dress, no pressure. Can put it on really quickly, no pressure. Size 10 body in a size 4 dress, putting that volume in there is going to take a little more time and it's still going to exert more pressure. So in that non-compliant mode, we often will set our target as pressure. So that's a preset peak inspiratory pressure or a preset peak airway pressure. We're going to flow gas till we get to the pressure target that's been set and the volume is variable. So you can see what the issue is. If I'm on a volume target ventilator, I'm going to flow gas till I reach that volume. And if half of my lung is derecruited, that volume is going to go into the open lung and it can over distend the lung. With pressure limit or pressure target, I'm going to flow gas till I reach that pressure, but that may actually result in profound hypoventilation, which then means I'm going to have retention of CO2. So very important when we talk about that. Now breath types for us in a basic ventilation class, there's only two for now. Those two are mandatory. The vent does the work and the vent controls start and stop. And spontaneous. The patient takes on the work and the patient controls start and stop as long as that spontaneous breath is not being assisted by the ventilator. So we talk about mandatory breathing and spontaneous breathing and somewhere in between that is assisted breathing which means patient makes an effort but the vent turns on. So every breath in assist control or control, every breath is a vent breath. In spontaneous, every breath, let me say it a different way, in spontaneous breathing, your patient can take breaths that are not fully assisted. They might be supported by the ventilator, but not fully assisted by the ventilator. And you also can dial mandatory breaths. So if I go into the room and look at a ventilator and I'm on spontaneous breathing, S-I-M-V, spontaneous breathing, and my patient is, uh, the rate is set at 25 and the patient's rate is 25, I'm really not breathing spontaneously. That's a mandatory breath. Every breath is mandatory. The only way you know a patient is actually utilizing spontaneous breathing is if the patient rate is higher than the vent rate the set ventilator rate. All right, so I don't want to confuse you too much. I just want to talk then about those common modes of ventilation and their targets. Volume targeted ventilation, we call that flow controlled, volume cycled. We apply that typically in assist control ventilation, typically assist control volume target. But we can also have assist control pressure target or as we most often will refer to it as pressure controlled ventilation. It's a time cycle and it's pressure controlled. Another pressure target of ventilation would be pressure support ventilation, which means we're going to flow gas to a pressure support of 20 or less. That means flowing gas to the target of pressure and that patient is actually mobilizing the gas and achieving a tidal volume. So this also pressure targeted ventilation, I don't want to explode your heads too much. You'll be sending me emojis with your head exploding. Pressure support or pressure targeted ventilation is the same also as IPAP with non-invasive ventilation. We target a pressure, the gas flows to that pressure, and then the vent delivery shuts off. Now combination modes for patients who are on spontaneous intermittent mandatory ventilation, SIMV, 
with pressure support for their spontaneous breaths means that we have a pressure target for the spontaneous breaths and also for the mandatory breaths they may be volume targeted or pressure targeted on those mandatory cycles. Now that's going to become a lot clearer, clearer for you in just one moment. So types of ventilation can either have a volume target or a pressure target. Volume target or volume control can be assist control or SIMV. We can always apply PEEP, that's a method to keep the alveoli open. That has nothing to do with the type of ventilation, that's a support mode. And in pressure control ventilation, we can also apply PEEP, that's a support mode. But when we talk about pressure control ventilation, we talk about assist control, SIMV, or support ventilation. So traditionally, but not always, that means you have to look at the ventilator screen. We talk about assist control as volume control. And then we talk about pressure control, which means we're controlling the pressure, but it still may be assist control ventilation. We just changed the target or the limit of the ventilator. Both volume control and pressure control can have PEEP. Both volume control and pressure control can be assist control, meaning every breath is a vent breath. If the patient made an effort, the vent turns on and it gives a mandatory breath but in relationship to the patient's effort. That you will typically see in all medical ICU patients. But in trauma surgical ICU, you will more frequently see the setting as SIMV, which means you get mandatory breaths, either in volume control or pressure control, and then you get spontaneous generated breaths, which typically are going to have pressure support. So strategically, it's important to know your, your mode and your target. So in report, I should say, what is the mode of ventilation? Assist control or SIMV? What is the target, volume or pressure? You'll blow everybody's mind if you're asking this in report because many people will not actually differentiate these things, but you'll always be able to go in and look at your ventilator screen and actually determine, is it volume control or pressure control? You'll know that by looking down at the settings, which will have tidal volume or pressure. And that's how you know what your ventilatory strategy is. Okay. In assist control, assist control means the patient does only the work necessary to trigger the vent. So they may have a negative inspiratory force of around two centimeters of water pressure and the vent turns on. In assist control, every breath receives a desired tidal volume if you're on volume ventilation or desired peak airway pressure if you're on pressure ventilation. Now what that means is I'm allowing the diaphragm to work the teeniest, tiniest bit. And this is a way to truly rest the diaphragm and all of the accessory muscles. Assist control. You have controlled rate, which means under which you will not uh, fall. So if I set that rate at 12, you're going to get 12 mandatory breaths a minute. But if the patient generates negative inspiratory force or redirects the flow, the vent will turn on and give them more breaths. So when I look up at the top of my vent screen, at the top of my vent screen, I'll see the frequency, which might be 20. And then when I look down at the bottom where I see the settings, I see that the settings are set for 12. In assist control ventilation, that means 12 breaths were control breaths. And because the patient was breathing 16 times a minute, four breaths were assisted breaths. And as I watch the screen, it will come up as C, C, A. C, C, A, 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 C. C means that's the time cycle vent breath, and A means the ventilator turned on because the patient generated a negative pressure or a redirection of flow, and the vent turned on because the patient made an effort. But every single breath, and assist control is a vent breath.
My patient just asked for more. So the ventilator is always assisting the patient. In assist control ventilation, you either have a set tidal volume if you're on volume control or a set pressure and time if set to pressure control. When I've set the pressure and the time, I can no longer look at a plateau pressure because I've set a pressure limit that I'm not allowing the patient to go above. Remember, in assist control ventilation, you have a minimum rate. So let's say we set it at 12. Down in the settings, you'll see F of 12. And up on the display screen, you're actually able to see if the patient had additional vent breaths because he's breathing 22 times a minute. 12 were vent breaths, so 22 minus 12 yields 10. 10 of those breaths were patient generated. That's assist control ventilation. Assist control, remember, patient does only the work necessary to trigger the vent and every breath receives tidal volume, the desired volume or the desired airway pressure. Okay. So let's look a little bit more at volume control ventilation. Guaranteed tidal volume with every breath. The pressure required, and it's not really required, it's the pressure generated. As the gas flows into the lung, flow, flow, flow to the end point of tidal volume, pressure is generated. And that is based on the resistance of the airways and the compliance of the alveoli. If I'm, in, if I'm having an asthmatic attack, I'm going to flow gas to that end point of tidal volume regardless of how much pressure is generated because that vent is going to push, 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 push the flow to the end point of the tidal volume. So that's really, really important when we're talking about these strategies and these mechanisms of ventilator association. Okay, so let's just take a quick look. This is an old visual, but it's so wonderful. Okay, so looking at the top, you're seeing pressure. And pre this patient has no PEEP, so they're at zero pressure, and they generate a negative inspiratory effort, and you see that because it drops down below zero. That's that first breath, down below zero. Vent turns on and assists to the end point of volume. Exhalation occurs, we're back to zero, patient makes an effort. Vent turns on, gives us the volume. And then we have a period of time, and what you're seeing is from the beginning of the breath to the next breath is a time cycle that has exceeded the value of the ventilator. In other words, if my vent setting was for 20, if I went more than three seconds from the first breath to the next breath, the vent is automatically going to turn on with a mandatory breath. So you can see here, assist breath, assist breath, mandatory breath. And now we're going to look down at the volume and the volume, you don't see that derivation of the patient making an effort. You only see that in the pressure screen. So you see volume, volume, time lapse, volume. And the volume is the same all across, same volume because whether the patient made a negative effort or not, the vent has turned on to give a volume control breath. So, Let's take a look at this in a more dynamic visual, appreciating that the first breath here, now you can see your airway pressure here is at around five, it's not at zero, and on the bottom you're looking at seconds. So your airway pressure is around five because you're on PEEP, okay? And you now have a mandatory breath because the time cycle, remember if I'm on a breath rate of 20, the time cycle is three seconds. My patient's made no effort in three seconds. The vent automatically turns on and gives that mandatory ventilator breath. And then two and a half seconds goes by and the patient makes his own effort. You see that here inside the red box. The patient's generated negative inspiratory force that actually turned the ventilator on. That was the signal for the ventilator to turn on and assist the spontaneous trigger. So when we talk about SIMV, it's a spontaneous trigger with a patient's own breath, but with assist control, a spontaneous trigger, and the vent turns on the breath. So you can see that you achieve the same exact airway pressure and actually the same, uh, if this is a volume control, the same exact tidal volume. Okay, 
So very, very important to remind ourselves that even though here we're seeing a peak airway pressure that's about the same, that peak airway pressure can change depending on the lung compliance and the lung mechanics, how fast or slow the flow is going, and what the tidal volume is. And you can see here, I've made this red arrow to remind you that PEEP is the start and finish pressure. Now remember, applying PEEP makes it easier to generate a breath because I have to generate less force in order to create a breath. So that's one of the reasons that we love PEEP. Okay, now we go to pressure control ventilation. That's usually abbreviated as PCV. Or if we have prolonged inspiratory time, that means slow flow over a longer period of time, pressure control inverse ratio ventilation. So we have lots of methods and different ways to achieve this, but pressure control ventilation is an excellent strategy that has an upper airway pressure level set, which remains constant, and the respiratory rate is set, and tidal volumes vary according to lung compliance. So pressure is the target and tidal volume is the variable. The ventilator delivers a set pressure level whether the patient triggers his own breath, assist control in pressure control, or the mandatory breath on time with the time cycle is being delivered. PCV, inspiratory pressure limit rather than tidal volume set by the practitioner. Inspiratory pressure and inspiratory time will be controlled by the practitioner and we determine that based on airway resistance and lung compliance. The less compliant the lung, the longer the time we want to deliver the flow of gas to the targeted pressure. So we flow that gas in to the targeted pressure but then we maintain the flow of gas to pop open your alveoli. Some other methods and some of the things that we talk about are pressure regulated volume control. So depending on your ventilator, that might be called PRVC, but for us, that's known as VC plus. VC plus means it's a volume control with pressure regulation. Tidal volume set, but it may not remain constant. Respiratory rate is set and that will remain constant from a control perspective. Ventilator will deliver the volume, however, the volume may decrease if the lung is less compliant with, you know, every second or third breath. This is actually a lung protective mode, and one of the things I want to let you know is that when you see a patient is agitated and sucking to deliver more gas, it's always important to consider volume control plus, which is a form of pressure regulator or pressure targeted volume control. So now we have the ability to have two targets. Our primary target will be volume, but our secondary target will be pressure. And the flow from the ventilator will flow faster if the lung is compliant and slower if the lung is non-compliant. VC plus is always something to consider when patients have severe agitation and they are dysynchronous with the vent. It's something to consider. It may not be the answer, but it's something to consider. Okay, so now we're just gonna take a look at some graphics. We're looking at pressure, volume, and flow. Okay, so with volume or flow control, so we're gonna flow gas till we get to a volume that has been preset. You can see pressure and volume look very similar in their aspect. So we flow gas in, you can see all the green is on inspiration. So we flow gas in till we get to the volume target and we have a, va uh, a variable pressure, okay? On exhalation, we drop the flow of gas, we return the flow of gas back to zero uh, and, and we have no volume moving into the lung and we have a pressure component, whatever that is, if it's at zero or if it's at five, which is your peep, that's where it will be. So what we always want to look at with volume and flow control, very importantly, is the reflection of the relationship of the gas flow to the peak of the tidal volume to the pressure. And then taking into account the blue lines, which is flow of gas must always be out completely before the next breath takes place. 
So you can see here, your flow of gas has returned to zero, and then the ne next breath can take place. So we've emptied the lung of gas flow, and next breath can take place. If the next breath occurs before gas is uh, flowed out, that's known as auto peep or intrinsic peep, meaning that we've trapped gas in the lung before the next breath occurred. Sometimes that's the desire of our settings, but if it's not the desire of our settings, this is deleterious for your patient. Now let's go over to pressure control. Green bean inspiration, meaning the inflow of gas, so you can see here, peak flow occurs and then you decelerate the flow rather than the square that we gave on the volume control with pressure control we push that flow of gas in till we reach the inspiratory pressure and then decelerate the flow of gas that actually maintains the pressure controlled over a period of time and you can see your flow dynamic has changed as well and i am not here to make you into a respiratory therapist but I want you to understand the difference between the two. We use volume, volume control ventilation when your lung is compliant. We use pressure control ventilation when your lung is non-compliant. The graphics appear different. You have to study graphics. You have to study them for a long time to have good understanding. But I want to introduce you to the graphics that will appear on your ventilator screen. And you always want to know, are they pressure, are they volume, are they flow? And when you're looking at graphics, you're going to get an idea of what's occurring in the lung capacity and the lung compliance. Okay, so now let's take a look at a graphic, okay? So what you're looking at here with your graphics, this is volume control on assist control ventilation. We actually do not ever control patients with ventilators unless they are paralyzed. That's the only time you can actually achieve true control. The rest of the time, the ventilator will always be uh, a servant to the ventilatory drive of the patient. If you want to control the patient and control the ventilator, you must paralyze the patient to control them pharmacologically so they have no inspiratory effort. So, VC assist control, volume control in an assist control mode. It's very simple. It's very predictable because your end target is tidal volume and that allows you to address tidal volume and frequency which is minute ventilation and it basically unloads all your respiratory muscles because even if the patient makes an effort, the vent's gonna turn on, okay? That's really important. As you're looking at this graphic, on the left-hand rectangle, what you're seeing on the top is the flow. That's V with a large dot over it in liters per minute. That's your flow. And underneath that, you're looking at the pressure of the circuit. Well, you might have said, why isn't the volume up there? Volume doesn't have to be up there. I've controlled the volume. I know that I'm delivering the same tidal volume with every breath. I don't need to look at it in a graphic. What I need to see is flow. Does flow return to the zero line? before the next breath occurs. So on our ventilator, green is inspiration, yellow is exhalation. So you see flow goes in and decelerates. And then underneath we see all that yellow is the, the uh, stopping of the flow and the flow out returning to the zero baseline before the next breath occurred. And underneath that, you're seeing the pressure in the airway circuit, okay? So let's look, and, and what I would tell you is this really doesn't look like volume control ventilation to me. It actually looks much more like pressure control. Okay, so next to that, we look at flow desynchrony. So on the top, what we're looking at here is the pressure circuit on the right-hand side, the pressure circuit, and the flow circuit. And what you're seeing in that pressure circuit is that little hump. That little hump says the patient is pulling against the ventilator. He's struggling to make that gas move faster. That's desynchrony. Now, this means that it can be very uncomfortable for patients. And it may lead to over sedation because we as nurses at the bedside are like, the patient's agitated. He's fighting with the ventilator. Let me make sure I make this point right now. If your patient is desynchronous with the ventilator and agitated, the first thing to do 
is evaluate if the vent settings fit the patient. When you over sedate a patient, you're making the patient fit the ventilator. And sometimes you need to do that. But that isn't the first choice. Ever, ever, ever. It's not the first choice. Look at the vent settings. Call the respiratory therapist. Have them come and look. And look at the fact that you have these notches, which are telling you that the patient is pulling against the vent. That's dysynchronous. So this flow dysynchrony, this pressure dysynchrony, this actually tells you that you have a patient who is not actually having his needs met by your ventilator. That makes him prone to respiratory alkalosis and much higher airway pressure. The tendency is because the patient is going to be agitated because the flow might be going not fast enough. So it's moving kind of slowly and the patient is like, I need more air. I need more air. And they're dyssynchronous because they feel like they're being buried under dirt. They feel like they can't breathe. The answer is not sedation unless you can't do anything with the ventilator to actually support the patient. So this always requires a call to your respiratory therapist. So we've come to the end of basics one of invasive ventilation. And we're going to move forward to basics of invasive ventilation two, where we're going to talk more about ventilatory strategies. What we want to remember is we look at peak pressures, we look at respiratory rate, we look at volume, and we look at whether or not our patients are agitated. Always considering that agitation should actually support a look at your vent settings before anything else to make sure that you are adjusting the vent to fit the patient, not the patient to fit the vent, except in extraordinary circumstances where everyone has agreed we need to make our patient fit the ventilator because that's the only way he can survive. Thank you very much, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.